So as you can see, we are have on the sort of a new design approach, whether that's new or not, it's up to judgment because the nature has been doing it for many years using carbon and build the carbon, build the food chain for us. So we're now building the food, the so-called energy for the industrial society. So in terms of energy, obviously we all know something about energy, but when you come to the bottom line, what is it that we're talking about today? Our energy society built on the so-called coal oil and gas. Our primary energy is 81% of our primary energy come from coal oil and gas. And beyond the coal, we have a shell. Some of you probably have heard. We have the so-called industrial revolution happening on the US soil. That's called the shale gas revolution. One of the center is Pennsylvania. Marcelo shale gas. So when we talk about natural gas today, after it's no longer so for the natural gas come from petroleum. This is gas coming from shale gas. 38% of our natural gas is no longer natural. It's called unconventional gas. So natural gas, as a part of this, actually is a shale already. Besides, we have a tar sand or oil sand. A lot of the oil sand, Canadian, is mining, producing, basically it's shipped down south to US. When I give the sand, as you know, our worker, the center of oil sand production. And I, I said that Canada has energy consumption intensive, they said, no, no, we don't consume it. We ship everything salt, meaning everything is consumed in the US, actually the oil sand. And then beyond that, we actually have natural gas hydrate on the ocean floor. And that uniform distribute around the ocean worldwide. And that's also important for resources. The only issue that is a false energy is it actually came with us from the dinosaur time, starting from 300 million years ago to roughly about 280 million years ago. Lots of the green plants and animals on land that produce organic matter that give us what we call today the fossil fuel. Starting from the first oil crisis in 1973 down to the next oil crisis in 1979, people began to realize that fossil is not renewable we need to develop more renewable energy. So renewable energy began to come into the picture starting from 1970s. And so now we have gone several decades in the renewable energy research in the so-called solar energy, biomass, and wind, hydro, geothermal. We are already using some part of that throughout the different parts of the nation, either wind or solar or hydro. Of course, we don't have big dam everywhere, but we have some places. So, uh, renewable energy often is viewed as a beautiful energy and as an energy we should have everywhere, but it doesn't actually happen that way. As I have a picture to show you here, <laughs> renewable energy actually has the issue of a low energy density. To carry a small car, you need a turbine 
lot bigger than the car to just get enough energy to keep the car moving. That stays one feature. Low density of renewable energy coupled with regional and seasonal variation and further down, daily variation. When blow the hardest, when you don't need it, that's the middle of the night. Sun shines, but there's no sign in the middle of the night. And so there is a sort of intermittency with the renewable energy. Another fact of the matter is the renewable energy is not that clean. Biomass or biogas, actually, it's a dirty. We need to do lots of processing to get the so-called clean energy. So renewable does not mean clean. Um, so in essence, we have no such a thing called a perfect zero body. If we have this one, everything will be dissolved, and, and that does not emerge. Of course, some of you probably read about, in 1945, President Roosevelt said, pretty soon the electricity will be too cheap to meter with the nuclear power. After seven decades, is the electricity too cheap to meter now? We're still far from there. So the US government has the policy, the so-called national energy safety, under former President Bush, under President Obama have been characterized as all of the above policy. We need a both energy, we need renewable energy, we need a nuclear, we need a hydro, we need everything. So all of the above. Um, and that policy still seems to be in place under our current national energy strategy. So at Penn State Energy Institute, just a few words about what we do. Um, our mission is to conduct impactful research and facilitate technology development. We actually from laboratory school to pilot plant to commercialization. And of course, as a university institute, we support and participate in the education and energy science engineering. And also we provide research survey to the industry in general, nationally and internationally, as our share with some of our program. So we have a 10 research program, including downstream, upstream, and somewhere in the middle stream, including fossil energy, the renewable energy, and the energy system. We have three energy centers, three research centers, plus multiple initiatives involving government, industry, and the international partners. And we currently occupy four buildings um, on campus, one building off campus. We partner with several departments for graduate students and some undergraduate students in the research and education part. One of the initiatives that I will share with you that we recently developed a national university coalition in energy research and that's funded by U.S. Department of Energy with a direct funding provided by National Energy Technology Laboratory, by the way. In case you don't know, this is the only one in the country called the GoGo Lab, government-owned, government-operated. All the other national labs in the U.S., they call the national lab but operated by either private industry or operated by side contract with maybe university. This is the only one, this is actually government agency called the GoGo Lab, government-owned, government-operated. So this is a part of the U.S. Department of Energy. The uh, federal employees work here, and they are providing $20 million for this university coalition. Um, I currently lead this program, and we have a 14 member universities. Our mission is to advance the basic of the applied research. This is why in the end we have a number of those initiatives that we developed at Penn State. We involve in multiple universities, some involve in industrial partners, and some involve in international partners. Just as an example of what we do. Here is a general national energy flow in the United States based on the most recent available figure. In 2018, the United States consumed historically record high number of energy. 101, 101 quadrillion BTU. Now, quadrillion is a huge unit. You can consider one quadrillion BTU as something that the United States will consume the whole country in the petroleum for nine days. That's a much amount of energy. Specifically, specifically on the 170 million barrel of petroleum. That's <coughs> one quadrillion BT. Or in terms of coal, that's 45 million pounds of coal is only one quadrillion BT. So if you build a, uh, a, a, a mile wide coal pile uh, and, uh, and then just uh, going around it, and you're probably going around that for 15 minutes, just around, around that pile of coal. That much is one quadrillion. So in the United States, we consume about 100 of one. If you just, for the matter of simplicity, consider that 100, then this individual energy sources can be read as a percentage. So we have a petroleum, we have a coal, natural gas. 
And this three come up to 81% of our primary energy sources. And we talk about the biomass, if it's about renewable, and we also have a hydro. So this is our main renewable energy, coupled with uh, wind turbine and geothermal. Nuclear is another significant part. Solar energy is becoming more significant now, but still less than 1%. With the double digit growth in the last 15 years, today we're still less than 1% of our primary energy come from solar. So we have a long way to go to reach the sustainable, renewable energy based economy. So that is one picture to keep in mind. Second important thing is, look at how much energy we put in, we mine this much energy, we produce this much energy, and we ship the majority of them in the electrical power plant, how much energy we get from our power plant, and how much energy we waste, technically, we only get 33% of energy out of the electric power generation. And the other 60% or more is simply wasted as waste heat. And that's a centralized power plant. If you look into transportation sector, the total energy that we make effective use of that is even less, less than 25%. So the bottom line is we waste more than 70% of energy in order to make use of that 30% or 25% depending on which depth we look at. So we have a huge energy waste. Despite the wonderful energy system we have, we have a huge waste. And these are the two major points that we can see from here. So in essence, when I was uh, uh, doing my sabbatical at the Imperial College of London, I went around worldwide, and then I came with my own homework called the Global Energy Challenges. So I'll share with you my homework I come down with uh, five global energy challenges, and this is sort of a high level. So the first one is to supply clean fuel electricity and water to meet the growing demand. And second, increasing efficiency by overcoming the limits of our existing energy system. We just said how much energy we need in each different re resources, and also energy efficiency as reflected in the previous national chart. And then the third one, not shown in the previous picture, is now, Eliminate the environmental pollutants due to energy utilization, particularly the emission, SOX, NOx, and the sulfur pollution, the nitrogen, also now today of course the CO2 in the global warming climate change, so reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, these three are obvious, but thinking further along the long term, which is where I come from in the area of CO2. When I started doing this, thinking 30 years ago, I was thinking more around the sustainable energy development in the real long term. Basically, it's a time for our children and even for our grandchildren to live in the society. The sustainable energy development involves more renewable energy and for one. Another is another strength area also at the Cornell is uh, led by Professor Linda Orcher, more storage capacity for intermittent energy. Intermittent energy, of course, is a natural feature of the renewable energy. But if we succeed in the energy storage capacity, this will be a huge help also for the fossil energy sector. We have a base load, we have a peak load. If we succeed in make, making a major mega scale in the storage capacity, we'll also make a fossil energy renewable, renewable sense that more sustainable operation more smooth. And finally, the sustainable material development our modern society really is based on carbon-based society. Just right here in this room, if we use myself as an example, from the glass I wear to the remote control I hold to the clothes and suits I wear, everything is carbon-based. Technically, this is a polyethylene peroxide-based fiber. My shirt is wrinkle-resistant shirt. If you wash it, you don't need to iron it anymore. This is organic carbon. And carbon-based comes from petroleum. So where does the carbon come from in the future? If we talk renewable, sustainable, that carbon needs to come from somewhere, and that boils down to CO2. That's my original drive 30 years ago, why I want to do the CO2 long before the greenhouse gas or global warming become an issue. So my research broken down into individual areas based on some of my vision of what would be important in the future, and therefore we structure our research in this five area. And actually, this is uh, just, I'm doing only a tiny, tiny part. 
and our this is a huge topic. Every one of these can be broken down to many sub-disciplines and different topic areas to work on. But this you can see is looking from five five thousand feet above to look at the issue. So when we talk about the CO2 issue, it's really an energy issue. As uh, John Hogan, former presidential science advisor and former Harvard uh, Kennedy professor said, the hardest problem in the environment is energy. The hardest problem in the energy is the environment. And technically, that intersection is CO2. Because we use carbon-based energy, therefore we have the greenhouse gas generated because of carbon-based. You have energy economic, you have a policy, environmental issue, all this is included, but still you boil down to greenhouse gas. And then, because 95% of greenhouse gas is CO2, and then two almost sometimes used interchangeably, of course we have methane, we have nitrogen oxide, they're also greenhouse gases. So the CO2 control, you can have any choice using natural gas versus coal, you have a less carbon density, you, if you can improve the energy efficiency, as we said earlier, you can double the energy efficiency without consuming more energy, you will meet the current demand. But can you do that? And then, beyond all this, because in the last 150 years, we actually consumed so much energy that Earth, it took the Earth 200 million years to accumulate, we consumed that within 200 years. A huge part, and still remaining resources if you only look at resource pyramid, we seem to have more energy today than 20 years ago. That's because more energy technology developed. You can go deeper, wider, and where you couldn't go before, now you can go. Where you couldn't drill, now you can drill. So that's a set, but resource is not getting more. We're certainly depleting. And but with that picture in the background, and now with so much CO2 in the atmosphere, we have gro global climate change issue, so we need to capture CO2 and store the CO2 to stabilize the atmospheric CO2 concentration. In the long term, we need to make use of CO2 conversion utilization to have a sustainable cycle. So that's my theme of sustainable development. Capture and conversion. So we'll begin to discuss in the next talk. Um, <coughs> so I, sh I mentioned earlier that, and actually when my um, thinking starts on CO2 research, and it has nothing to do with the greenhouse gas issue or global warming and climate change. Those terms were not yet invented while we're doing this. But this is simply my dream in the sense that while I was doing my PhD, I was doing trying to develop new catalysts to make synthetic liquid clean fuels from coal as a way to mitigate the issue caused by the petroleum oil crisis. And so I was thinking at the time that could we use the CO2 and the hydrogen made from water in the ocean, and CO2 captured from fuel gas or from air. And then reacted two together, we can make a chemicals, we can make fuels, we can make materials. The material that I initially thinking was the chemicals like all the things. We can make a polyethylene, polypropylene, this is actually the polymeric materials, we can make chemicals and fuels and materials in that sense. If we achieve in doing this, Water gets recycled in the system. We don't waste water anywhere. The water doesn't even get out. So we pump the CO2 in, we get the hydrogen in, water is internally recycled, and we produce a fuels and chemical and material. If we can achieve doing so, we would achieve sustainable development of fuels and chemicals. And when my advisor was doing the editor-in-chief for a journal called Energy and Resources, and he asked me to write something uh, for that journal, so I actually wrote this, and he was asking me that um, um, perhaps that doesn't really sound realistic. You really sure you want to put that in writing? That sounds like a dream. I said, please let me dream. So <laughs> the article ends with, I'm dreaming of using CO2 and water to make chemicals and fuels and food. So that's my first publicized dream. Well, um, turns out I haven't wake up yet. I'm still dreaming, but uh, uh, we certainly have made a lot of progress. I'll share with you um, uh, where we are today. In terms of vision for the future, I think this is a personalized vision, and maybe I'll be happy if you share the vision, and I'll be happy if you yell at me that this is uh, nonsense, it doesn't really make sense. I'll have to accept that as well. 
But at the end of the day, I hope that we have reached some point where through the technical discussion, we can make a more informed decision on this issue. The vision is that if we capture and convert CO2 into fused chemicals, organic material and inorganic material, including building and building materials, and this is an important path for sustainable development. Specifically, we can say we can produce a sustainable supply of the super clean green carbon-based fuels and chemicals. If we succeed in using hydrogen produced from water with renewable energy, organic materials like polymer, inorganic such as carbonate, building blocks or road paving materials, and then we will significantly reduce consumption of fossil fuel. Therefore, we avoid the CO2 emission that have negative CO2 emission as well as the methane, SOX, and NOx that will be environmental pollutant. If we do so, we reduce water use, we reduce consumption of fossil fuel, which in turn cause negative emission and mitigate the negative environmental impact. Well, sounds great, right? That's a vision. That's what I'm really sick, that's a vision. Um, well, anyway, that, so I'll share with you some of the practical side on what we did that make it a little closer to reality. First of all, we capture CO2, we need the hydrogen, but two thirds of cause of CO2 management and CO2 capture. Well, that's well known fact. And do we report and publish on that fact? How can we lower the cost of CO2 capture? Um, I actually, being an engineer, I like to analyze the solver problem. And, and people worldwide have tried to analyze it. For example, this is what current industrial operation is. Stripping, absorbing, stripping. This is Absorption does not require energy. It is a stripping part, removing CO2 from a CO2 solvent that where the energy consumed. So the picture basically is 15% of energy, so heat up the solvent to high enough temperature to release CO2. That heating takes about roughly 15% energy. It's a four gigajoule per ton of CO2 capture. 15% for heating, but we heat the solvent above 120 to 140 degrees C, is about the water vaporization temperature. So water evaporates and that consumes 35% of energy, that's pure waste, doesn't contribute to anything. So here are 15% and 35%, can we cut these two together? So we remove 50% of our energy base. We have 100% efficient improvement right there. Can we do that? Second is for desorption of CO2, because the traditional industrial process, still the current commercial process, using primary aiming based chemical bonding to bond the CO2. So 50% of four gigajoule per ton of CO2 is to break up the CO2 aiming bonding. And so can we cut the 40%, 50% down to 40 or even 35%? If so, we would have improved efficiency for my more than 100%. So again, how can we realize that? Here's my dream in reality. One is that you're looking at my proposal 21 years ago. The figure that I'm sharing with you is my original proposal. The idea is, if we can create a nano porous materials, we no longer need the water, no longer need the solution, we no longer have evaporation. So we cut the 15%, cut the other 35% out, we already have 100% up, theoretically. And how can we achieve that? We use a polymer instead of current monomer. But polymer is there, people know the polymer, polymer do nothing for the CO2 capture. And that's because there's no interface. You need interface. How can we have the interface? Well, I'm a cast guy, I work on porous materials. And so our idea is create a nano cage and then stretch this polymer three dimensionally in the molecular cage in a nanometer scale. This is three nanometer. If we succeed in doing this, we can three dimensional stretch this polymer just like we build a tree, and each leaf of the trees serve as a CO2 capture site. So we call that, just like you pack an apple orange in a basket, now we're packing CO2 in your high density, we call molecular basket. Well, that name, capture imagination of myself and capture imagination of a lot of people. So even today, people said you had a cool idea to give the name called the molecular basket. It sounds cool, and I'm still excited with this. Um, and so, once we pack the polymer into this narrow porous material, and this electron micrograph here, even with a 50% of polymer, half the weight of the polymer in there, the polymer itself is a liquid, but once you pour the polymer in the narrow porous liquid, they serve as a free-flowing solid. 
It looked like a white powder flew thrown on a piece of paper. On the doctor microscope, there's a nanopowders. And that, when we use that for CO2 capture, it actually captured 10 times more than what the commercial dissolvent did at the time. And one of the senior researchers from Mitsubishi Chemical, which is a commercial producer of a dissolvent, said that this is a better than anything that in the RMD stage, at least three times better. And that was very encouraging in the early stage of my uh, development in this area. Um, and another thing that is uh, for people who have some ideas on the absorption of physical chemistry, you know in general when a absorption happens, the molecule loses entropy. So it releases the heat. Typically, thermodynamically, when you're increasing temperature, a absorption should decrease rather than increase. And this is where in the early days of our research, and we have found this trend over many years and for many different examples. This is one of the recent examples uh, in here, and, but by no way uh, original. An earlier result, we already reported in 2002, so 10 years before this paper. But the trend is that when we increase in temperature, the absorption capacity not only didn't decrease, but actually increased significantly with increase in temperature. And lots of people said, no, this is wrong, something's wrong, the experiment is wrong. Of course, it wasn't wrong. We actually went back and forth so many times to confirm that we know there are true experimentally, and turns out this is so-called kinetic control. Kinetic control is a speed control. The reason there's speed control is because we're embedding polymer in a crowded nano space, and that the polymer does not have much of freedom to move around due to the intermolecular bonding interaction, just like the two arms tangled together. And so what we need to do is give a little bit more kinetic energy, let them stretching and vibration to start, create more intermolecular space and then now molecule can flow through. And so that is the case indeed. When you increase the temperature up to a certain level beyond that temperature, it goes down with further increased temperature. And this is a norm, it's actually thermodynamic, true, making sense. We actually done spectroscopic study and to actually collaborate with our um, friend at the Oak Ridge National Lab with the SU2 experiment on the FDIR spectroscopic condition. You can see that capacity increase in temperature and for those, if you don't mind, I'll just simply say that this peak representing the molecular chain fraction, the actual CH2 fraction, increasing the temperature, causing the more molecular vibration, so this peak increasing the temperature. And the picture that is consistently the spectroscopic evidence is, initially we have the polymer, it's closer into molecular interaction, angling. As we increase in temperature, the molecular stretching become more stretched out, so we create a space in between the molecular chains, and that make more of the polymeric site available to CO2, that way it capture more CO2. So it makes good sense in that sense. Another thing is, previously, if you want to use a dissolution, you need to set up a tower to take out the moisture before you can capture CO2, because fuel gas has a lot of moisture. And we actually set up to say that we don't want that as separate tower. We want to do it integrated, so energy efficient. It turns out that the moisture in the gas actually helps improve the CO2 capture even more to the point where a significantly higher CO2 capture capacity is moisture up to 10%. And then beyond that, it doesn't help any much. So this is another desirable trend and for this to be practical. And this is probably the only chart I will show you that now for those of you that he doesn't sound like an engineer, there's no equation in the slide. There's one slide that I'll just show you. There are some equations, and there are a lot more, but I just don't want to bore you with the details. But this is some dynamic isotherm to show that what is the principle for the absorption of polar? It's the one that's so-called the Langmuir isotherm, that the molecules do interact selectively with the site available on the polymeric absorbent and we call the Langmuir isotherm, and there's an equation, and we can actually capture it, and theoretically determine it, and doing so. And then, after we've done that, we put a commercial absorbent, experimental reported, and our own work together, all on the same chart. It turns out that our system are two to three times better than anything ever reported commercially or experimentally in the literature. When we put this chart together, our sponsor in the DOE, in the government, was very, very impressed. They felt that this is the first evidence that 
people ever produced in comparison with the very different materials on the same scale. Of course, we put in lower scale and different pressure and different temperature and different capacity. This actually is the key chart that allow us to get a $4 million from DOE to build a pilot plant to actually demonstrate to show this is not only true in laboratory, it actually can operate in four-story high buildings. Um, we also did the test on NOx and SOx, and to make sure that we can use a molecular bath adsorbent to capture not only sulfur, uh, CO2, but also NOx and SOx in a separate waste, just as an idea and the concept of waste. Chris Jones at the Georgia Tech actually have done a, a nice survey of various type of materials available for CO2 capture. Let me put our materials, molecular bath adsorbent, together in the low to medium temperature range, and this is a high capacity materials in this type of structure. Um, and we also look at the different and narrow forest system, and depending on how the forest system grows in the so-called nanoscale, we could have a different capacity in terms of capacity, but can actually that's a different thing. Um, I also should say that Coming to Cornell without mentioning Cornell work must be very guilty. So I actually do have one slide to share with you uh, by uh, Professor Giannani's work um, in, in, in their group. They actually collaborated with Alisa Park at Columbia and Chris Jones at Georgia Tech. Um, Professor Giannani is a specialist in synthesizing new materials. And they synthesize like this kind of capsule-like silicon, almost like a hollow structure. And then uh, using the uh, example that we published using polyethylene imine, but using their structure, they publish a higher capacity using this type of structure, a uh, higher CO2 capture capacity. So very interesting work. I have uh, uh, mentioned this in many, in many of my talks of uh, the analysis work. I also want to show you that after our extensive work over the years, we also realized that in our early nanoforce materials work, there's one fundamental drawback, and that is slow diffusion. Molecule move in, if you have a nano chain, you find at the beginning, you travel all the way to the end, that's 700 nanometer. And we found that we need to actually fundamentally change that by changing the nanostructure. So more recently, we changed completely different strategy to have a reverse conic structure on nanoscale. The reverse conic is big mouse, small belly. So the molecule can get in fast and diffuse out fast because every minute we have a several ton of CO2 produced and that's only a small part of flow gas. We need to make it super fast to be able to handle the mega scale. So we created the mega reverse conic structure for fast mass transport. And this is a lot more successful. Also, for different polymeric structure operating different temperature ranges with different structure and the independence uh, for CO2 capture. And based on the success, DOE supported us to build a new pilot plant. So I'm standing right here with my industrial collaborators, and we have a four-story high pilot plant. The top of the reactor is on the fourth floor. We're standing on the first floor, and we did industrial demonstration successfully to show that this works. So, so far, good, good, and no one had any objection on the CO2 capture. Everything, everyone says it must be done. The question is CO2 utilization. A lot of my friends in the early days would say, you know, anything you do with CO2 is a waste of energy, and that waste of energy only leads to more CO2, therefore it's worthless. That's still, in some part of technical community, that's a general idea. I want to share with you a different perspective. And just look at the one picture, you develop one impression. Whether people have the will to say, well, look at the downside, 180 degree different direction. This is another one. Right? You may not believe me this is the same guy look at it from different angle, but I can demonstrate to you. <laughs> so, well, this is something that I, one of my point that CO2 is a base of using CO2, not quite. Uh, so why do we want to convert to CO2 chemical and fuels? Well, Mother Earth is doing a global carbon cycle for many millions of years. This is a global carbon cycle from CO2 to the biomass, biomass on land, biomass on water, lead to animal on land and water, when the animal dead, become dead organism, most of that basically recycle back to CO2 through the aerobic decay. Only in certain regions through the delta and segmentation, we have what is the so-called fossil accumulation. 
and that leads to what we have today as fossil fuel. Of course, in the last 150 years, we burned so much fossil fuel, we closed the loop, but we also built so much CO2 in the atmosphere. In the renewable energy research in the last 20 years, the global has advanced so much on renewable chemical and fuels based on biomass, but that depends on Mother Earth to do first a three to five years of work to build the biomass first. So for us to be sustainable and consumption match up with the scale, we need to do something fundamentally using CO2 through catalysis, using hydrogen to make CO2 chemical, in the way we produce them to match with the, the scale that they're being utilized. Well, the, where does the hydrogen come from? If the hydrogen comes from fossil fuel, of course, that's a joke, right? That doesn't make sense. So that hydrogen must come from water with renewable energy. If we succeed in doing so, well, we do have a sustainable cycle. But of course, CO2, just for chemicals, is not that large enough to match the CO2 amount produced. Fuels will become on the same scale. Power plants produce CO2, and CO2 used for fuel making transportation, they are always on equal amount. But then we also have actual CO2. Well, um, one of the ways to look at this, well, CO2 conversion is so somewhat dynamic and you can see therefore shouldn't be done. That's one of the common view. But when you look at the somewhat dynamic, it's not that quite true. First of all, we do lots of cool work at the energy consuming industry. Produce industrial oil fuel, for example. Consume lots of energy, but no one ever thinks that way because oil fuel comes with a price tag. It's worth money, but CO2 is worth less. Therefore, the so called market economy drives that way. And in the current commercially cement industry, well, we have material that we handle with energy so much lower than CO2. But we do that every time because cement actually has a dollar and <coughs> it has market value. So no one thinks that waste energy. And so, of course, Grishma is doing excellent work in bringing CO2 into mineral carbonate as materials. And this will be some of the dynamic favor as well. And what we're trying to do is almost like a fishing. Using a chemical, which is like a fish CO2 out from the deeper part to create something in between like methanol or hydrocarbon or other things or CO. And this is one way to make a summer dynamic more feasible. Um, of course, the hydrogen comes to issue that um, DOE has a target of 220, uh, 2020 and $2 per kilogram of CO2. But the two years ago, German company already claimed they achieved this in the summer using renewable solar-based hydrogen production. They already achieved this. And I think uh, Professor Linda Archer just shared with me this morning that the solar energy cost, solar energy-based electric generation cost has gone down dramatically in the last decade. And so there are a lot more hope for renewable energy-based hydrogen production. And, and there are commercial efforts using that area. And electrolysis of water to make a hydrogen is used in one of the first commercial plants built by Sunfire in Germany. And they have a three-stage power to liquid using CO2, basically to convert CO2 to CO in their second step. And the third step is using commercial established technology to convert the CO to hydrocarbon liquid fuel. And that can be used to power diesel or even airplane. And this is the currently the commercial effort and when we went to Germany a few months ago, we talked about this again there. Um, for us to develop a new science that's based on CO2, and there are actually wonderful opportunities I'll share with you a huge example. Can we design new catalysts that no longer require on the Fisher trough, which is you convert CO2 to first CO, and then using commercial separate process? Can we do CO2 specific chemical conversion? The examples, answer is a yes, but the story is it takes some years of effort, for example, Iron catalyst will do some conversion, but that doesn't show a good efficiency. Cobalt catalyst, commercially already established for CO, doesn't work at all for CO2. When you can do CO2, it only gives you methane, nothing else. But what we have discovered that using nanostructure, as we create a whole nanostructure catalyst, we can actually significantly maximize the liquid production C5 plus or olefin production C2C4. Using the same ion, but in different nanostructure, we can change the chemistry. Another example using core shell nanostructure, Gabosomogai and Peidong Yang at UC Berkeley created the pictorial of the core, nano, core shell nanostructure to convert the CO2 to methane and also C2. 
we actually create a new bimetallic acid, we can double and triple the higher hydrocarbon production from CO2 with a selective range of surface chemical composition. And this is actually um, not only applicable to liquid. We can selectively create olefin, like a polypropylene and polyethylene type of uh, olefins. If we have C2 and C3 here with this cathode, we can change the surface to selectively turn 100% of a propane to nearly, nearly 100% of propane. Next the last stage is action. We can select and make it if we want that product. Just an example. Um, and I, without getting into further detail, I'm sharing with you that computationally, on surface reaction pathway, we have uh, calculated how the reaction kinetic changes, the barrier or activation energy barrier changes with the surface chemical composition. Then we dope the copper onto iron surface. The reaction pathway suddenly changes, so a new intermediate going through what we call HCCO without going through CO become connected the most stable pathway. And to show that in a reaction pathway, typical cathode with ion, CO2 would go to CO. And this is as expected. People worldwide believe this is the only way. So industry is doing this already. But we have created a new pathway with a bimetal catalyst. CO2 to CO is no longer energetic favor. Instead, the CO2 to HCO it's energetically, it's only one third of energy compared to normal cost. So we create a new path that no longer pass through the conventional reaction pathway. By doing this, with this catalyst, we can selectively, using CO2 as feedstock in one step, we can create a liquid hydrocarbon fuel. Selective with 55% of the product liquid hydrocarbon fuel. As an example, we can make a fuels or we can make a chemicals, C2, C4, all of it. So, we can do this. Another example is on the alcohol or methanol. Professor George Ola, who won the Nobel Prize, actually proposed what is called the methanol economy. And I was honored with the George Ola Award for our work. Um, but this uh, so-called George Ola renewable methanol plant is built in Iceland using CO2 as phase stock to make a methanol. And this is using commercial copper zinc catalyst to the methanol synthesis. We have a created a new catalyst that has three times better productivity for methanol. Select with methanol is certain composition of palladium copper bimetallic catalyst. And we also done the detailed kinetic simulation to show the chemistry why certain catalyst, particularly with the palladium copper 111 on the surface alloy, uh, one reaction pathway that leads to the HCO intermediate selectively, produce the most energetic favorite pathway more easier to produce methanol. And so this is a pathway, of course. I realize that not everyone is uh, interested in this kind of mechanistic fuel, just to simply to show you that we can change that pathway, we can taste that um, by changing the surface. Also, if we want to make a C4, for example, C4 is another one of the top seven industrial feedstock worldwide. We can select to make a C4 if we want to, using CO2 as a feedstock, select to make C4. 90% of the product is C2C4, and out of that, 55% is C4 alone. So in one single state, we can do it now. Just another example, it just lasts two minutes, we can create a hollow nanostructure to turn the CO2 and methane into thin gas for commercial operation today. This reaction actually is a very quickly deactivating with conventional catalyst. And even the advanced camp, they quickly deactivate, so practically very difficult. But when we create a hollow nanostructure catalyst, and the reaction now produce smoothly without carbon deposit. The carbon nanostructure plays a very important role, and the catalyst nanostructure, for example, one of the recent structures we create is using our human lung as the inspiration. We create our millions like nano capsule, and this is the human lung structure is shown here, and this is our synthetic structure. This is a transmission electron micrograph, the structure that we actually made. Um, we can create this kind of structure using that for catalyst, tailored selective reaction for atomic efficient pathway. So the vision that I described earlier, if we give you a pictorial representation, is current of force of fuel through power plant, through transportation, can be replaced by a new way using CO2 
through catalyst to make a chemical organic material, green and renewable fuels. The CO2 can also be made into building construction materials. By doing so, we create a new sustainable cycle, chemical building materials. So uh, I will stop here, although the conclusion is, uh, is clear, and you just repeated what I just said, said and to share with you. Um, but of course, one cannot do the work without the partnership and the sponsors. So many government agencies and many industrial partners and many international partners have participated in the work that I present to you. And not only of my former student and postdoc at Penn State, but also our colleagues and students in our Penn State. It does not want me to acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> so to save your time, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. from that power, immediately circuit to the absorber. 
say the continued flow of the absorbent stages, absorbent stages, so continue to generate the CO2 and continue to flow gas.